Welcome to Discovering the Northwoods from the Manitouish Waters Historical Society. We will take you on a journey through our local history with the help of primary source documentation. To learn more about this rich history or about the Historical Society, check out our website at nwhistory.org for blog posts, show notes, our YouTube channel, and a full transcription of this episode. As with many historical works from this era, there are phrases, terms, and descriptions that are inappropriate to our modern sensibilities. The Manitowish Waters Historical Society in no way condones these offensive remarks or passages, but chooses to read this publication in its entirety for educational purposes and accurate historic context. We would like to introduce The Fishing Grounds of Rest Lake by E.C. Potter. The original source was published in the Outer's Recreation Special Fishing Number in April of 1918. This episode is read by me, Brenna Riley. This is the first of a very valuable series of articles describing northern Wisconsin lakes in such detail as to furnish fishermen with an accurate guide to the fishing grounds on the lakes covered. The series has long been in preparation, but we are now able to make the beginning of the articles that will appear month after month for an indefinite period. We hope before the series ends to cover a very considerable part of Wisconsin Wonderland. The utmost care has been exercised in gathering the data, and we believe the information contained in these articles will be found absolutely reliable. Mr. Potter, who is writing the series, is a very thorough investigator who has visited the lakes personally and is making no statement that he has not verified. The maps are being made by Rand McNally & Co., the big Chicago map publishers, which is a guarantee of their accuracy. Every time I go fishing in a new place, I want to take a pot shot at the resort keeper because he doesn't furnish me with a map of the fishing grounds in his gosh darned lake. I do not hate fishing or anything, on the contrary. It's easy for me to go fishing any old time, but I can't see the joke in going on a weekend trip to a new lake and spending the biggest part of it exploring the lake to find out where to fish. There's no getting away from the fact, though, that if you want to catch fish, you have got to have some idea what part of the lake the fish are in. We all know how to catch small mouse on a sandbar and big mouse around logs and stumps and pike and muskies in the weed beds and a lot of things like that. And most of us know enough to blame the poor fishing of a glassy day in August on the weather instead of on the resort keeper of his lake. But what we do not know oftentimes at a strange lake is to tell from where you sit, just where the weed beds and the stumps and other things are. And I found a lot of other fellows that feel the same way. Now, I fished Rest Lake in Manitwish Chain quite a bit and caught some fish. And I'm going to give you boys a description of the shoreline and what you can expect. So if you go up there any time this summer, you'll have a little idea of what you're up against when you start to try out that new bait. I'm not afraid of all of you catching my fish, for I don't get up more than two or three times a summer. And then the Manitouish chain is big. There are a good nine lakes in it. Rest, Island, Spider, Stone, Mud, Clear, Manitouish, Alder, and Rice, all connected by the Manitouish River, and there's lots of fish in all of them. So if any of you fellows think you can catch them all, go to it and see if I care. One of the things I especially like about the Manitouish country is that it's primitive. It's wild, as wild and primal as any country I've ever saw. Less thickled, settled than the territory a little further south. And if you can gaze across its broad expanse of the lake and timberline to see the vestige of stone walls and cobblestones, you've got an imagination that's beyond mind. To my mind, one of the most delightful trips in the great Northwoods is the journey through the entire chain. It's all wild. Each lake is different vista of charming primal beauty. The channel is deep enough to take most any powerboat, and there's about a dozen resorts on the chain, but none of them are electric-lit, boardwalk variety. 
They are primitive, many of them log cottages, as in the days of early settlers, in an environment genuinely wild. The best way, in fact, the only convenient way to get to Rest Lake is on the Chicago and Northwestern, getting off at their Manitowish station. They have a train leaving Chicago and Milwaukee in the evening that gets up to Manitowish by daylight. And as the liveryman always meet it with their autos, you can get to the resort just in time for a good breakfast and an early start on your fishing. When I go to Rest Lake, I usually go to Mitchell's. It's a good resort about 12 miles from the town of Manitowish, and I've always found the eats and sleeps excellent. They set a good table and lots of it. Their beds are nice and dean. Buck and Son run the livery at Manitowish and make trips anywhere you want to go reasonably. In fact, the average charge from Manitowish to Mitchell is only $1.50, as they usually have at least three people for each car going to the resort. Of course, a special trip for one or two people would raise the ante a little. And by the way, the auto trip from Manitowish to Mitchell in the early morning is one of the most delightful in the whole North Country. The roads are mostly woodsy trails along the bank of the Manitowish River, and it is beautiful, although the timber is now more cut than it used to be. Now, I've made a sketch of the fishing grounds in the lake and sent it to the editor, and if I... S- And if he sees fit to spend a few dollars and have a map made of it, I'll vote him a good sport, and I know you will too. Anyway, this is the way we found the fishing grounds last September, and I haven't heard of any earthquakes or anything up there last winter, although the guides say the big muskies and the ice push the stumps out occasionally. But it's not probable they changed enough to make a difference. The good grounds commence right in front of Mitchell's boat landing. In fact, there are a couple women there last year. Their husbands had gone fishing and wouldn't take them along. So they got a boat and went out by themselves, and after fishing about a half hour, they hooked a 25-pound muskie that dragged them most all over the lake before some men came along and shot it for them. Leaving Mitchell's boat landing and starting down the west shore of the lake, First, you strike a bay that is a jungle of dead trees, logs, and stumps with a weed bed in front of it. There's about as many big fish caught around this weed bed as any other place in the lake. You can't fish back in this bay to any advantage because there isn't one chance in a hundred you'd ever land a fish you hook. He would take half a hitch of the line around the stump and then come up and stand on his tail and laugh at you. And if you went to hit him with an oar, he'd shake out of the hook and hike back into the jungle. But if you'll fish around the weed bed, you'll pretty quick snag one of those investigative old fellows that have come out of the jungle and is prowling around looking for a chance to turn some other smaller fish into a muskie. There's quite a clear channel here in front of the weed bed, and you shouldn't have any occasion to tell how you just about got him up to the boat and then, etc. On still evenings, when the fish are feeding, this bay, back among the stumps, is a constant ripple and splash which shows where the fish are all right. From this bay and all the way north, down the west side of the lake, the shoreline is sand, coarse gravel, and rocks. The deep water runs close to the shore. There are many small bays, however, and in most of them are quite few stumps and fallen trees that make a good place to cast for bass and pike. The same character of line continues well down the dam. Just before you reach the dam is a good place to camp. There is a clear, bubbling spring there, and the shore is level and clean. Going on past the dam, you will find some good ground, several weed beds on a sand bottom, and some stumps and fallen trees. Soon, you will come to another dead jungle, like the one across the bay from Mitchell's, but just before you come to it, right on the point, marked by a few snags and deadheads, starts a sandbar that runs clear across the lake, to the island just east of Mitchell's. Now, while we're here, I will tell you about this bar. As you know, bars in the middle of the lake are usually the places you catch the most fish. On a calm day, if the surface of the water is still, you can see the bar under your boat all the way across the lake, and that is the time to get lined up in your memory with the shore landmark so you will not lose it when you go on a cloudy, rainy day. 
The bar zigzags in some places, runs down deep, and there's weeds in the bottom all along that make it excellent cover from which the big ones will come out of the rush as your bait goes over them. Along this bar is an excellent place to troll or still fish with live bait on a warm day. And when the fish will not bite along the shore, you are always pretty sure of a nice catch if you work along this bar. As you go around the shore from the starting point of the bar, you come to the north shore of the lake, where you will have to turn southeast. This is a big jungle of dead trees, stumps, and fallen logs, and you cannot get your boat around through it. Hut out in front of it, and the same as the one across the Mitchells is. There are many weed beds all around to the point and all of this is good casting for bass, pike, and muskies. What killed this tumber was a building, or a dam, years ago by the lumbermen to float their logs down the lake above, this having hacked up the water onto low timber land. This jungle extends around into the bay on the east side of the lake, and the hay is particularly good pike and musky grounds. There is a good growth of weeds on the bottom and quite a few fallen torts and a lot of good sized muskies must have been caught there. The weeds don't get high enough to snag your hook till pretty late in the fall. Coming out of the bay, you'll come to a point or sort of a peninsula, which is an excellent place to cast or still fish for smallmouth. The best place for small mouse is always around a rock or gravel bar, as these fish seem to be more partial to that kind of feeding ground than any other. This point extends quite a way out into the lake and shelf rests at the bay on both sides, providing a splendid place to fish on wind days when the other parts of the lake get too rough. As this peninsula has quite a bend to it, and the bay on each side you'll hardly ever find the wind in such a quarter that one of these bays is not quiet water. Continuing around the shore, you'll find bays nearby with a vegetable growth on the bottom, which are excellent spots for pike and muskie. Then you come to a clear water sand and gravel shore, which continues around on the island close to Mitchell's. This is a low land shore, but it is not swampy, which makes it excellent bathing beach and camping ground. This is a good place to rest your casting arm and troll a while. Following the shoreline, you come to a narrow channel between the island and the mainland. While we did not take any soundings, it looks as though when the water is low, there would be enough water at the extreme south end of this channel to let you through, but it is a good speculation, always, to fish around the island. It is good for trolling as some of the big ones have been caught there. This island is on the other end of the sand rock weed bar that runs clear across almost the whole length of the lake. Just as you pass the island, you come to the mouth of Manitouish River where it enters Rest Lake and along here and up to Mitchell's boat landing is good grounds. This is a sand shore, but with high banks and an abrupt drop of the bottom with deep water close to the shore, so you will want to keep close to the shore. There is the occasional stump or fallen tree sticking up that makes good cover for the old pirates that would like to lay around under something and watch from some fortunate young one to come along so your bait is likely to be taken for something good to eat most any minute. The south end of the lake has several reasons for being pretty good grounds. Being at the mouth of the river, there is a tendency for feed to be washed into the lake here. The jungle bay over west with its weed bed is front for excellent cover, spawning ground, etc. The bars and sand and gravel shores offer variation of loafing place for some of the particularly prosperous fish that do not find it takes all their time to make a living. Never having been the kind of fish that spends all his time in water, I am naturally not thoroughly conversant with their habits, but it would seem pretty logical that a fish should enjoy the diversion of occupation of roaming around after a while on a nice, clean, sunshiny sandbar, and then going and prowling through a weed bed, the same as a man, bird, and beast like to do. One thing for a while, and then go do something else. Anyways, we know we catch them part of the time on the sandbar and the other time on the stumps and the weed beds. While there are a lot of bass and pike and rest lake, as with the rest of Man and Twist chain, is ordinarily considered more of musky lake than a field of other varieties. 
There are a lot of muskies in the entire chain. There have been a lot caught that weigh 30 to 40 pounds. The red is a lot of 20 pounders. They really are the best fish to both catch and eat, and even a 10 pounder is nothing to get disgusted about. There is an occasional perch on the pike or the walleye, or pike perch. At least I have not seen any of the great northern variety caught there, and there are no pickerel in these waters. While the great northern pike will be found quite plentiful in certain Wisconsin lakes, there are tributaries to the Mississippi. They seem to be more abundant on the east of the divide in the Ontogan, Presque Isles, Turtle, and other tributary waters of Lake Superior. How do you account for it? Never mind now, I can't conceive of any subject on which I have more diversified and positive opinions can instantly burst upon like a rain of shrapnel than are launched when one begins to comment upon the why of a fish. But wouldn't it be nice to know for sure just why and when and where a fish does this and that and the other? Thank you for listening to Discovering the Northwoods by the Manitowish Waters Historical Society. As always, I'm your host and producer, Brenna Riley. We hope you enjoyed this episode and come back next time for more adventures through the Northwoods.